Law enforcement is without a doubt one of the most dangerous professions one can do. And as you'll hear in today's stories, it can also be one of the strangest. I am Fear Crawler. Welcome to the video. Several years ago, I took a 911 call for a family reporting their teenage daughter was possessed. They claimed no possibility of drugs or a history of mental issues, which I of course didn't believe for a second. Family members were holding her down and I could hear two people screaming at each other in the background. I asked the caller to tell whoever was yelling at her to stop. The caller said, it's her. I responded that I knew it was her, but whoever was yelling at her at the same time needed to stop. The caller said again, it's her. Both voices. I kid you not, it was the creepiest thing I have ever heard. I've been doing this for 25 years and I've heard many things. I know of man's inhumanity and the horrible things people do to each other, but this was a different kind of evil. I was clearly hearing a young girl screaming at the same time an adult male was yelling back. I couldn't understand either language, but they were clearly two different voices. The family swore both voices were coming from her at the same time. It made my skin crawl. The lieutenant listened to the tape and looked at me and said, Do you ever wonder? Yes. Yes, I do. I've seen a lot of things in my career, things that would make a citizen doubt my sanity, from being dispatched to chase a UFO to responding to calls of ghosts. But the most unusual thing that happened to me was witnessed by several officers and a dispatcher. One evening, I had brought in a guy for domestic violence, and he was a bit rowdy. I was joined in booking by the sergeant and another patrolman. I'm in the process of booking Mr. Tough Guy when I glanced into cell number one. There was a guy in there, short haircut, glasses, and a white t-shirt, just staring at us. I ignored him because I didn't want him to start banging on the windows demanding a phone call or something. So I finish the booking process and I escort Mr. Tough Guy to his cell, walking past cell number one. The guy in the cell just stood there never saying a word or moving. We all then leave booking and we go about our business. Some time later, the sergeant asked me to check the paperwork for the prisoners to see if any were ready to transport to county jail. I grab the paperwork and go into booking to do a head count. Cell number one was empty. I panic and I tell the sergeant who also panics, and he and I begin to make phone calls to the detectives to see if they had moved the guy, or if they had released him. They all said that they hadn't gone into booking at all. I then checked the computer and the paperwork again, and the head count was accurate. No one had been placed in cell number one. We go to the dispatch office to check their surveillance video for booking. We rewind the footage to where I can be seen booking my prisoner. We fast forward to the point in the video where we all walk out. As soon as we walk past the door, the guy in cell number one blinks out of existence. We were all freaked out by the occurrence, believe me. When we tried to transfer the video to a DVD and a USB drive, the guy in the cell did not appear. We still hear and see stuff every now and then, and prisoners in the detox tank can be seen talking to someone in the direction of cell number one even though it appears empty. To this day, I am wary of going into booking alone. I answered a welfare check call late one night, between 2.30 and 3 a.m., on an elderly woman who lived next door to the caller and had not been seen for some time. This night we were having a bad thunderstorm without the rain. I get to the complainant's house to speak to her first, wondering why she had called at this time. She tells me that the lady next door is in her 90s, lives alone, and she has not seen her in several weeks. She explained that she has called, went over and knocked on her door, but the lady will not answer. I start thinking she's probably deceased, and has been for some time. The car has a three inch layer of dust on it, the mail is piling up and no lights are on. 
First I walked to the side door and knocked on the door with my flashlight, knocking loud enough that an elderly person with some hearing should be able to hear it. After a few minutes of no response, I turned around and walked to the backyard, looking at the windows and I find everything okay. The complainant is with me and is saying she doesn't know of any relatives of the lady. I am sure by now that she is probably deceased. I walk to the front of the house and I notice that her blinds are up on the front windows, and I can see a glow from inside. I am however not tall enough to look into the windows, which are probably 7 feet off the ground. The complainant runs next door and grabs a bucket for me to stand on. I get on the bucket and bingo. I can see the living room. The glow was from the TV, which was on a blue screen, and is bright enough that I didn't need my flashlight to see in. I looked first at the floor to make sure she had not fallen there. Couch, recliner, everything was empty. The telephone home base was blinking red with the missed calls and voicemails. From the living room was a hallway that was dark and I couldn't see down it. Using my flashlight, I could only see an open door down the hall. Still no signs of life. I turned around and told the complainant that everything looked okay and that nothing was disturbed. I turned back around, and an elderly woman is looking back at me, with her face right up next to the glass. I couldn't breathe. It felt as if I had been hit in the chest by a bat. I fell backwards and off of the bucket. I hit the ground hard and the complainant rushed to me. I pushed her off as she was trying to help me up, and I ran back up on the bucket. My heart was pounding, but I had to see. Instinct had my hand on my gun, and the other was up on the window. I looked back inside, and I saw a frail elderly woman standing in the hallway, wearing a long nightgown, with her back to me. She turned her head to the side and looked at me out of the corner of her eye, and slowly walked out of view, and down the dark hallway. That unnerved me. I got down and looked at the complainant who was standing there with a puzzled look on her face. All I could say was, I saw her. But now the wind had picked up and it began to rain. I began to walk back to my car by the road, and I turned back to the complainant and said, Don't come back here. I got into the car and drove to the PD. I never found out about the lady who lived there. The complainant didn't call back and the house now has different tenants inside. Some things are better left alone. Over 20 years ago, I took an alarm call from an old PTA building across the street from a courthouse in Austin, Texas. The alarm had already gone quiet when I showed up with a senior officer. We found an unsecured door slightly open on the east side, so he posted me there while he finished the perimeter, and other officers arrived. I was staring right at the door when the alarm activated again, and the door slammed shut in my face, loudly. The senior officer ran back to my position and asked why I closed the door. I told him I didn't. We called for a canine and the dog arrived shortly. I went in with the canine to clear the building. We found nothing, but the entire time the dog was acting very hinky, like someone was in the building but he wasn't picking up a scent. We secured the building and a key holder showed up. He said, Well, you know this place is haunted, right? There was a secretary that worked there about 30 years ago, and after she died, she kept showing up for work. Papers fly off the desks, doors close, the works. We both told the key holder that the next alarm call there was all his. I was working at our jail and while doing my watch tour, I was heading into medical and I heard two people having a conversation. I thought it was two inmates in a cell talking. I went to the first cell and there were no names on the door, so I didn't look in. I went to the next door and it had one name on it. I opened the hatch to look in and there was a guy in there. I didn't say anything to him at first, and in closing his hatch he asked me if I could move his neighbors over, because he was alone and would like some company. 
I then went over to the previous door and checked in the window, just in case someone didn't put the names on the door. I looked in, and there was nobody in the cell. I went back to the guy in the other cell and I asked him if he heard people talking, and he stated yes, they had been talking a lot. I informed him that there was nobody next door, and then I got out of there. I work on county roads and I had a signal 100 at 3 a.m. and my closest bathroom was 30 minutes out. So I pulled down a dark gravel road and started doing my business. I felt like someone was watching me. I looked toward the rear bumper of my unit and approximately 20 feet behind my rear bumper, I saw a shadowy figure standing there. I stop and I zip up, not finished, and I yell out to who I thought was a person. I got no reply from the figure. I start to apologize to the figure, thinking this was the landowner coming over to see who was peeing on his driveway, but there was no response. I then go into tack mode and demand them to show their hands and identify themselves, but there was no answer. I finally get smart and I use my light to see who it was, and as the light passes over the area, the figure was gone. Keep in mind this conversation was about 20 seconds long, and I just saw something there. I look around and I hear no running through the brush. I turn to get into my unit and I take one more look back and see a shadowy figure move towards me from where I last saw it. Needless to say, I got in my unit and I sped off, because bullets were not going to stop this spirit. One year our department started receiving complaints of headstones being knocked over in a city cemetery around Halloween. The chief advised us on midnight shift to spend our extra time around the cemetery to catch the person or persons causing the damage. Me being sneaky, I found a good hidden observation point about a block away. There were two major well-lit streets providing fair lighting in the cemetery. For several nights, I would from time to time stop and check the cemetery with my binoculars, and only patrol the cemetery at the start and end of my shift as usual. One time checking the cemetery, I spotted something that looked like a cat walking on its hind legs. I watched it walk approximately 10 feet between headstones and I lost sight of it. I rushed over to the area in my patrol car turning on my spotlight, alley lights, and takedown lights. I couldn't find anything but a track through the dew on the grass that dead ended at a headstone. To this day, I can remember how it moved and its outline in my binoculars. It was creepy. I'm an avid hunter and I've done plenty of hunting at night. I'm very familiar with the animals in my neck of the woods, and I have never seen anything like this. Myself and a buddy on my squad responded to an alarm. The incident location was an old office-type building that had been converted to doctor's offices. There was a pharmacy attached to it. Our dispatch received a motion signal from an upstairs office. The keyholder arrives on scene and we go in to secure the building. The stairs were locked behind a door that, of course, the keyholder didn't have keys to. So we took the elevator up to the second floor. The elevator opens to a pitch black hallway except for one overhead light at the end of the hall. We start checking doors, and so far all are secured. We get to the last office, and sure enough, the door is unlocked. We make entry and observe it to be an unused office. The door opened to a sizable waiting room and a reception area. There are about 10 or 12 exam rooms, all cleared with no hiccups. We exit the office, and immediately, something seems off. That was when I realized that the overhead light at the end of our hallway that had been on was now off and was replaced by another light over the elevators. I look at my squad mate and he's completely white. I ask him what's wrong and he says, weren't all those doors we just checked closed and locked? I tell him yeah. So my buddy says, well now they're all standing open. Sure enough, all the doors down the hallway we had just checked were now standing open. Pucker factor sinks in at this point, so we start clearing and securing offices. 
we finished the last office, and on our way out, just before we turned the corner to get to the waiting area, the main door just slammed shut. Then our radios start going nuts with some kind of static feedback. Now I just want to get the hell out of there. We get back to the elevator and head down to the first floor to make contact with the key holder again. However, the key holder was nowhere to be found. I contact dispatch and I request a callback number for the key holder so I can advise him of what we found. Dispatch states that the key holder was still en route to us and was advising an ETA of five minutes. I advised dispatch that we had already been out with the key holder. Dispatch request I give them a call. I call dispatch and she tells me that there is no way we were out with the key holder. She states that the alarm company had only just made contact with one. Eventually the real key holder arrives on scene and I ask her about the man that led us into the building. She asked me to describe him, so I did. She states that that sounds like one of the doctors that used to lease the office on the second floor, at the end of the hall. She states that he had committed suicide at his summer home several days ago. I still won't go back there. A few years back, prior to being a sworn law enforcement officer, I worked as a security guard at a hospital. Sounds cool, and it was. Except for the fact it was 9pm to 7am, I worked alone, and the hospital I guarded was abandoned. A year prior, the hospital built a brand new facility to replace their five-story tall 1900s building. When the employees and patients left, they left everything in place. It looked like the people just disappeared in a hurry. Partially full coffee mugs, uniforms hanging on coat racks, wheelchairs in the halls. Everything as it was with a good coating of dust. I was always a third shift kind of person, and I don't get night jitters or scare easily. But this place could do it to the best of them. Every night I would walk or ride a wheelchair through the halls that were supposed to be empty or unused and every night I would end up having to close doors and relock them. I would walk one floor, move up to the next, and continue on. I got a little shaky when an hour after already walking down a hallway, I would have to turn off the same hall lights and close the same doors again in the building. Or when I would be walking a hall and then I would hear footsteps on the floor above me, doors opening and closing, elevators moving from floor to floor, phones ringing, nurse call lights going on. There were only three times when I got a I hate this feeling. The first time I was checking offices on the fourth floor. There was a light on in a locked hallway. This hallway hadn't been renovated since the place was built, short of electricity, so everything was from the 1920s. Unlock the door, flip the lights and walk out. Relock the door and turn to leave. Behind me I hear the flip of a light switch. Through the frosted glass, I see that the lights went back on. I left the hallway alone that night. The second time I was riding an elevator between floors. I was taking the elevator to the top floor when at about the fourth or fifth floor, I could hear laughing and muffled talking. It kept getting louder as it got higher. The elevator made it to the fifth floor and the door swung open. And there was absolute silence. Of course, every light was on on the floor, even in the patients' rooms. I checked high and low and there was not a single living or breathing person in that place except for me. The third and worst of all was just an average night. I'm on the lower level locking a door in a corridor. The door had a glass metal but on the back sides it was covered with white tape. The room it led to was dark and the hallway a few feet behind me was partially lit, so the glass acted like a perfect mirror. Everything normal. Key in, lock clicks, turning the key. When behind me, I see the full outline of a person walk past me in the hallway, clear as day. Just a full shadow of a person walk past. I froze for only about a second, and then I ran into the hall after this supposed person. There was no one. Just silence. After a year, it felt like I should have been an exorcist with all this stuff happening. The other guards that worked on the days opposite of mine had the same stuff happen, 
except they always saw nuns walking into the rooms just outside an old chapel on the third floor. Better nuns than something else, I guess. When I was a municipal cop, I was sent to a runaway juvenile call. The town I worked in was inner city and poor, but it was one of the better streets in town and the family was squared away. The husband and wife were both educators. While I was taking the report of their runaway teenage daughter in the family's living room, an older daughter who was in the room pointed toward a hallway and yelled, Grandma. The husband ran into the hallway yelling, Ma? Ma? The husband returned to the living room and asked, Officer, did you see her? Did you see my mother? I told him I had not, and I asked him why it was remarkable that his mother had walked down the hallway. The husband replied, She died last year. We see her walking around the house all the time. I took the rest of the report while standing on the front porch. I was sitting in the flat of a hill monitoring traffic. It was about 2 or 3 a.m. Where I was sitting, it's a well-known spot where an unsolved murder victim was found about 26 years ago. No other officers would sit there, even though citizens are constantly doing 15 to 20 miles per hour over the speed limit in this area. As I was sitting there, I saw a shadow cross the back of my unit, coming from the passenger side. Almost immediately afterwards, the shadow came up to the driver's side of my unit and then across the front. Mind you, it's completely dark in this area, and the only lighting around me is from the moon. Thinking the worst, I turn on all my lights and light up the area to see if I can see who or what is around me. There was nothing. I figured it was time to leave that area. Once I got to a lighted area, I stopped and realized that my camera was recording from where I hit my emergency lights. I reviewed the footage and you can see where a figure starts from the driver front of my unit. Then for half of a second, the entire camera goes black, as if someone put their finger over the lens. Then it goes back to normal. Needless to say, I haven't sat back in that spot yet. I got a call for an alarm at a new water tower they were building. The alarm company also has cameras on the site, so when the alarm activated, so did the cameras. The alarm company advised that there were two teenagers observed going under a sign. I was already in the area, so I was on the scene quickly. The alarm company stayed online and said that they have not passed the camera again. A few more units get there and we are checking the site for this sign. Well, we find it, but it's not a sign. It's a piece of construction equipment. And when you go under the sign, it leads to only one place. The entrance to the water tower. So we go inside and immediately hear people talking. We shine our lights toward the next landing and it stops. So we're giving commands and all that, but no response. We were considering climbing up there, but the ladder was being held on by a carabiner. And we can't figure out their harness system. We call one of the workers out so it takes them a bit to get there. We're sitting there BSing inside the tower because it's cold and we decide to turn our lights off. After a minute, the talking resumes, along with what sounds like someone walking and shuffling around. So we shine our lights up and it stops. We do this three or four times and it's the same thing. The guy finally gets there and he goes up the ladder. He checks everything on that level and then the next level, and then the actual bowl. But there was no one up there. That's all for today's video. I do hope you enjoyed these stories. Until next time, everyone take care, be safe, and above all, stay scared.